Thank you, Seth, and good morning. I hope all of you had a great Thanksgiving and are ready to move on in the Gospel of John from a glorious 10th chapter to the equally glorious 11th chapter. It's difficult to say which chapter is the greatest in this great Gospel of John, but we're on chapter 11. We're going to look at a rather lengthy passage. It's a lot of narrative, and so we're going to look at chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. And of course, we'll have a break in this next week and then resume it the week that follows. But uh, you remember the Lord has had a discussion with the Jews, the Jewish leaders, and others around him. And they wanted to know if he would, who he was. They speak plainly, are you the Son of God? And he has spoken plainly to them. He said in verse 30, I and the Father are one. And they understood exactly what the significance of that was. And we read that in verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. The conversation continues as the Lord challenges them. And they realize as he continues and to demonstrate that from the scriptures that he is the Son of God, that they again sought to grasp him, arrest him, stone him. So he left. He left the region. He went to the eastern side of the sea, to the, of the Jordan River. And um, that's where the chapter ended with a great ministry that he had there. Many there were told in verse 42 believed in him. Well, now verse 1 of chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews we're just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awake him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who's called Didymus, which means twin, as you can see in the margin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. 
Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. In the crypt below St. Paul's Cathedral in London lies the body of one of England's greatest military heroes, the Duke of Wellington, a man who knew the terrors of death long before he faced his own. He saw it at Waterloo, which gives weight to a statement he made that that man must be a coward or a liar who could boast of never having felt a fear of death. That fear is common and universal. And yet, the Apostle Paul told the Philippians, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Death was not lost to Paul. Death was gain. It was profit. I don't know what the general thought of the apostle, but he was no coward or liar. Still, how could Paul speak so assuredly and fearlessly about death, the king of terrors? The answer is found in John 11, where Jesus, standing near the tomb of a good friend, declared, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Those were not empty words or a vain boast because he then proved them by calling Lazarus out of the tomb and raising him from the dead. This is the seventh and final sign in the Gospel of John. Each one is a miracle that illustrates some particular aspect of Christ's authority as the Son of God. This one shows that He is Lord over death. He is God. He is God the Son. And as Bishop John Ryle wrote, He makes the grave itself yield up its tenets. When the chapter begins, Lazarus was sick and Jesus was far away. He and his disciples were beyond the Jordan, on the east side of the river, outside of the land. He had gone there from Jerusalem after an attempt had been made on his life. Men accused him of blasphemy and picked up stones to stone him. So he wisely withdrew to a safe place. But now he learns that his friend Lazarus needed him. Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, lived in Bethany on the east side of the Mount of Olives, about two miles from Jerusalem. Jesus was a frequent guest in their home when he visited Jerusalem. Luke records on one of those visits in in chapter 10 of his gospel that when he was there, Mary sat at his feet learning from him. Both sisters were completely devoted to the Lord. Mary's devotion had become celebrated. John says, It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped His feet with her hair. He records that incident in the next chapter. But he mentions it here because it was already well known long before the Gospel of John was written. The Lord had a very close relationship with this family. And the sisters made a request for His help based on that relationship and their confidence in His love for them and His power. Lord, behold, they said, He whom you love is sick. God's people get sick. Those whom the Lord loves suffer trials in this life. We shouldn't think it's strange when when we fall on hard times. But we have a Savior 
who is Lord over all times and circumstances and conditions, which also means he could have prevented Lazarus' sickness, but didn't. He can prevent every problem that we experience, but he doesn't. In this fallen world, we suffer physically and spiritually. It's no sign that the Lord doesn't care. Here it was Lazarus, whom you love. And that's a present tense, and it, it indicates constantly loves. Even while he was sick, the Lord loved him. We should never forget that. These things happen to us for a good purpose, and the Lord will, will state that shortly in regard to Lazarus. But trials are no sign that he does not love us. He does. And based on that love, the sisters asked for his help. In fact, they were so, so confident of it that they didn't panic. They didn't say, come quickly. They simply reported that their brother's condition was grave and confident that he would respond to their request in mercy. Now that's faith. Those who have that, who, who trust him and know he loves them, will never be disappointed. Not for long, not forever. We see that here. Jesus gave a positive response to the request. This sickness, he said, is not to, is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. He didn't mean that the, the sickness was not fatal. Lazarus did die, as, as we know, but his sickness would not end in death finally, ultimately. Death would be defeated. Lazarus would, would be raised. That's the Lord's meaning. And, and Jesus would be glorified in that in, in a way far greater than he could have been by healing a man who was sick. It was the climactic miracle, the, the greatest miracle, because it was the reversal of the, the greatest ruin, the greatest loss, with life triumphing over the grave. And so to ensure that the, the miracle would be indisputable, that Lazarus would be in the grave for four days, John wrote that he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. After that, he said, let us go to, Jeru to Judea again. Often, God does not give an immediate answer to our prayers and our cries for help. That's never due to callousness, never due to indifference on his part. He always answers in a way and a time that is best for us and brings glory to him. Waiting though, is never easy. What, what enables us to do that is understanding that everything around us is governed with perfect wisdom. The Lord does everything well. He does everything in the very best way. And that's how we're able to wait when, when we hear nothing but silence when we make our requests and, and there doesn't seem to be an answer. Now, that's faith that can endure those periods of silence. That's mature faith, firm faith that is, is able to sit still and wait on the Lord. That's persevering faith, which is grounded in an understanding the Lord is sovereign and the Lord loves His people. Well, two days passed. The disciples thought that Lazarus would recover from his sickness when the Lord announced that they were returning to Judea. The disciples were less than enthusiastic. Rabbi, they said, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you're going there again? It was an objection that he answered with, an enigmatic statement, a kind of mysterious statement that really comes off very much like a, a proverb in verse 9 and verse 10. 
Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? Of course, he knew there were 24, but he's speaking of the daylight hours. There are 24 hours of daylight, or rather 12 hours of daylight. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Labor in those days was uh, limited to the daylight hours. Night was not safe and hindered work. So if a person wanted to finish a task, he had to work while he had the opportunity to do that in the daylight, in the 12 hours that were available. And it was the same for our Lord. He, as, he, as long as he followed his Father's will, he was like a laborer working under the sunlight. He was safe, wouldn't stumble, and could succeed. But his time was short. We're, ending, we're, we're nearing the end of his ministry here in chapter 11. So he was, as it were, in the 11th hour, and he needed to be doing the work of his ministry, taking every opportunity that the Father gave him. And this was an opportunity for him to reveal himself. And as long as his disciples were walking with him in the light of the world, him who is the light of the world, walking with Him in obedience, doing the will of the Father, they were safe. The work of God cannot be frustrated. Then He told them that the reason He was going back into Judea and into danger, into harm's way. Lazarus, He said, had fallen asleep. And He was going there to awaken him. Sleep was the Lord's way of describing his friend's death, and it would become a Christian euphemism for death because sleep is pleasant and sleep is temporary. We rise from it. In his commentary, Leon Morris commented that nothing demonstrates more clearly the difference Christ's coming has made than that, overcoming death, defeating death death. He wrote, throughout the ancient world, the fear of death was universal. Death was a grim adversary that all men feared and no man could defeat. But Christ did. And because of him, death is sleep. We close our eyes in this world to open them in the next, in the Lord's presence. And Lazarus would rise from his death like rising from sleep. But the disciples didn't get that. They didn't get it. They didn't understand what he was saying. Understandably, I think. They, they took the Lord literally and, and wondered why he would put their lives at risk and his life at, at, at risk, his life at risk in order to wake up a sleeping man. Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. So the Lord spoke plainly. He said, Lazarus is dead. Then he added the surprising statement, and I'm glad. Glad because it would strengthen their faith and it would strengthen the faith of those that were there in Bethany and strengthen the saints down through the ages. All of this, though, was, was still not clear to the disciples. They hesitated to go until one of them Thomas spoke up. When we think of Thomas, we think of the doubter. But here he acted with courage. Let us go also, he said, so that we may die with him. He didn't understand the, the Lord's need to return to Judea, but he was, he was still willing to go and die with him. Better to die with him than live without him. He had the heart of a true disciple. When I say that, I think uh, part of what I'm saying is we don't always understand what the Lord is saying to us. We don't always understand everything that we read in Scripture and the, the path that we're following, but we know we need to be faithful regardless. And, uh, and that's a genuine disciple. And that's what Thomas displays here. He had the heart of a true disciple. And so 
through his exhortation, they were moved and they left. They, when they arrived in, in Bethany, which is high up in the Judean hills, Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Many Jewish friends were there comforting the family. Many had come from Jerusalem, which, as I said, was just over the Mount of Olives, less than two miles away. When Martha learned that Jesus had arrived, she went to meet him, and she greeted him with the words, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, those were not words of rebuke, but regret and faith. She knew he could have prevented her brother's death and healed him. That's faith. And if, as if to ensure him that her faith had not been shaken, she added, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She'd not lost any confidence in him. And he assured her that all would be well, that Lazarus would be raised from the dead. Your brother, he said, will rise again. Now she took his words as an attempt to comfort her with a reminder of the, of the future resurrection at the end of the age, which was a doctrine of Orthodox Judaism. It's one of the doctrines that the Pharisees held. The Sadducees didn't believe it, but the Pharisees held the resurrection of the dead to be true. And that was Orthodox Judaism. And she didn't imagine that Jesus might be indicating here that he was about to bring Lazarus back to life and raise him from the grave shortly. And so, as a, a good Orthodox Jewish woman, she confessed, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She, she had that hope. That's great hope. But the Lord then goes beyond the doctrine to direct Martha's faith and confidence to him personally when he declared in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Now that's the fifth I am statement in this gospel. It means he's more than a person who knows the secret to the resurrection and the way to life. Both are in him. I am it, he said. And ag again, as, as we've covered in the past number of times that we've dealt with these I am statements, it is a reference back to Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, where God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and identified himself as I am who I am. He is ever-present, eternal, and self-existence. That's the significance of that name, and it's illustrated by the event that Moses was witnessing, the flame burning in the bush, but the bush not being consumed. And you'll remember what we've said about that. What that illustrates, what that shows, is the nature of God, that He's independent of the creation. He's not part of the creation. He's distinct from it. And He is independent of that bush in that it's not drawing His energy from it. He exists apart from it. Self-sustained, self-sufficient. That's the Lord God. And the Lord was claiming that about Himself. I think He's saying, He is the one who spoke from that bush. He's saying He's equal with the Father. Which is again a claim to deity. And therefore a claim to be the source of all life, both physical and spiritual life. And by drawing Martha's attention to Himself, He was telling her that more is needed than confidence in doctrine. Personal faith in Him was necessary in order to rise in the resurrection. So Jesus added to His claim to be the resurrection and the life that He who believes in Me will live even if He dies. 
All who believe in Jesus Christ as God the Son will live forever. Death will not prevail. It will not hold us in its cold grip. The believer will overcome the grave in the resurrection on the last day. Well, what does it mean to believe? Uh, we can define it in different ways. I think a very simple way to define saving faith, this belief that he speaks of, is it means simply to trust. It means to transfer confidence from self to Christ. The Lord said those who do that will live. They will have a glorious future. But he adds something more to that in the next statement. Our hope is not limited to a distant future. It is a present blessing as well. He said, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Those who put their trust, their faith in me will never die. Now, on the face of it, that, that might seem a little confusing. Jesus just said, the believer will live in the resurrection to come, even if he dies. But now he said the believer will never die. What does he mean, the believer will never die? Lazarus was certainly a believer. He loved the Lord, and the Lord loved him. But he was in the grave. Believers in Christ die every day. He couldn't be speaking of physical death, obviously. So what did he mean, never die? He meant that everyone who believes in him escapes spiritual death. What is called the second death in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Eternal death. To put it bluntly, damnation. And we escape it because we have spiritual life. That's what the Lord gives to all who believe in Him. It is eternal life. It, it begins in the soul at the moment a person believes in Him, puts faith in Him, trusts in Him, rests in Him. That is a, a major emphasis of this gospel. We saw it back in chapter 3, verse 16, one of the great texts of the Bible. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The chapter, chapter 3 of John ends, He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 3, verse 36. Life, eternal life, is received through faith alone and at the moment of faith. And what a blessing that is, because as that last verse of the chapter points out, those who do not believe live under, constantly under the wrath of God that can fall at any moment. Well, it is light, the, the life of God that is given to us, this eternal life, life in the soul that brings about a fundamental change in us. It is active. Life is active. And the life is active in a distinctive way, this eternal life that he speaks of, this eternal life that we receive that overcomes the eternal death. And it's characterized by love. It is obedience, but we can become very specific because John wrote about this new life, eternal life, in other places. And in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, he gave love as the identifying feature of it, as the Lord does in chapter 13 of this gospel. But John there wrote, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Life can't contain itself. It is active. It breaks out. It bears fruit. And God's life is known by love for others. Uh, for the undeserving. This, this is not to be understood in the sense of there's a condition that you must meet in order to be a child of God. What John is saying in 1 John is here's the evidence of the new life. You love the brethren. 
Life produces that. You have within you the life of God, and it is natural that it will reveal itself. And for us to know that we have this life, we know it by our love for the Lord, and specifically, as John puts it, our love for God's people. So if you wonder uh, about yourself at times, if you lack a little bit of assurance, uh, ask yourself, do I love God's people? If you wonder if you have this salvation, uh, we, we need to ask ourselves, what do we think of the people of God? You know, sometimes they're quite unlovely. So it's not an easy thing to love the brethren always. But do you care about them? Do you want to associate with them and minister to them? That's evidence, proof of life and a consequence of having God's life in us. It will produce that within us. Not to, to the fullest degree, of course, we grow in that, but that's an evidence. And we receive it through faith alone in Christ alone. And that's just the beginning. Death cannot end it. Jesus promised here that though someday the believer will die physically, he or she will not die spiritually. And they will live again physically because they will be raised to life. And because of what Christ has done and because of what He has put within us. And He can do that. He can raise us from the dead and will do that for us because He is the resurrection and the life. That, that is our great hope based on that great truth. But truth that is true only for those who believe in Christ. And so Jesus then put the question to Martha. He asked, do you believe this? The truth of God's Word always calls for a response. We may find it interesting to listen to lessons on the Bible. We may find it interesting to, to, to be taught, and we should. If we're God's people, we should find great interest in that. But it requires a response from us, and it always does. And so and the Lord puts the question to Martha, did she understand this? Was Martha understanding and believing Him? And she responded in verse 27, Yes, Lord, I have believed that You are the Christ, the Son of God, even He who comes into the world. True faith, saving faith, is faith with correct content, doctrine. It has an object, and the object of Martha's faith, which is the object of saving faith, is Jesus Christ. It's not clear how much she understood of the Lord's I am statement, but she had an enlarged understanding of who He was compared to others. In fact, she says, you're the one who comes into the world. Remember back in chapter 10 when the Lord is defending Himself? We looked at this last week. He spoke of Himself as the one whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world. They didn't understand that, or at least they didn't believe that. They understood that He was saying He's more than a man. He's God's Son. Well, she is accepting it. You're the one who comes into the world. So in, in her confession, she made three points. First, she said that He is the Christ. He is the Messiah, the anointed one, the hope of Israel, the, the fulfillment of the, 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 the prophets of the Old Testament. And second, He is the Son of God. Again, it's hard to say how deep her knowledge of that was, but she was right in what she said and, and, and knew certainly that He's more than man. He is God and man, He is the eternal Son of God. That's the meaning of what she's saying. Well, if He were not, we could have no hope of eternal life, no hope of the resurrection to come. Only the eternal Son of God can give what Jesus promised here. 
And that leads to a third point, that Jesus is he who comes into the world. She knew that he was the sent one from the Father, that he'd been sent into this world to fulfill the promise that was made early on at the very beginning, at the dawn of human history, when Adam and Eve were about to be sent out of the garden, guilty of sin, with the promise, nevertheless, of Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would come, crush the head of the serpent, and deliver God's people. They had the promise of a deliverer to come. That was the mission in which our Lord was sent, and Mary confessed faith in it. Now that's her, or rather Martha, that's her confession. She believed these truths about Jesus. Her understanding may have been small, like a, a mustard seed. That's genuine faith often is. It begins the size of a mustard seed, which is say it begins very small, but it's alive. And because it is alive, it, it grows. And she had fundamental trust in him. That's very clear from what she said, but... Her trust was defined by truth. It was defined by doctrine. And as she would increase in her knowledge of it, her understanding of who Christ was and what he had done, her faith would grow. And she would be able to say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is the hope we are given. Every believer is given this, this hope, that hope in this fifth I am statement, I am the resurrection and the life. Our God, the triune God, is a life-giving, death-defeating God. As Jesus said in chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. It's the good life that He gives us, the orderly life, the healthy and helpful life, a life turned outward toward others in love, not inward toward self, not a soul curved in on itself, a soul that goes outward to others. And it is unending life that overcomes the grave. But... The world paints a very different picture of this life that Christ gives us. British poet and pagan Charles Swinburne hated Christianity. And he wrote the line, Thou hast conquered, O pale Galilean. The world has grown gray from thy breath. Christianity has taken the fun out of life. The joy out of life. That's what he was saying. Well, that's just the old lie that Satan told in the garden when he convinced Eve that God was keeping her from the best, from a full life. He's keeping you from being a goddess, is what he was telling her. But that's a sham. That life, the life that the world exonerates, the life that Satan was exalting to Eve is a life full of confusion, selfishness, sorrow, guilt, hopelessness, bleakness. And the way the world mourns its dead proves, proves that very plainly. The hopelessness of life for the unbeliever. The Soviet Union fell a little over three decades ago. So some of you weren't around to uh, remember the funerals that occurred in Moscow from late 1982 to early 1985. The, the old order was passing away. In a period of two and a half years, there were three state funerals when three successive leaders, head of the Communist Party and head of the Soviet Union, died. The first was Leonid Brezhnev, followed by Yuri Andropov, and then Konstantin Chernyenko. Uh, the news carried at least parts of 
those services. I remember watching them on television, giving viewers in the West a, a glimpse of how communism and atheism deals with death. Not well. They have no hope beyond the grave. And their state funerals reflected that. They were all the same. Same protocol, same thing. Dreary ceremonies of black crepe and somber music. Their hymn was Chopin's Funeral March. Depressing. Could ask uh, Elizabeth to, uh, or Esther to play it and you would go out of here terribly depressed. It would be the worst sermon you'd heard me preach. Now, I've done a lot of funerals. Christian funerals. And they are always times of sorrow, but not despair. They are full of hope and joy through the tears because it is sleep for the Christian. It is temporary. The ancient Thessalonians lost loved ones. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul informed them about those brothers and sisters who are asleep, he said. So that they would not grieve, Paul said, as do the rest who have no hope. We grieve, but we don't grieve as do the rest, as do the pagans. Death is an enemy, Paul said. We, we shouldn't be cavalier about it or treat it tritely. It is a, a, an enemy that, that it, it causes great grief. Paul calls it the last enemy but it's a defeated enemy. And those who are asleep are with the Lord and will return with Him when He comes again to establish His kingdom on the earth. The world doesn't have that hope. It, it may think of death as sleep, but it has no certainty, no real hope in that euphemism one of the, the famous lines from Shakespeare is to sleep, perchance to dream. It's from the Hamlet soliloquy that begins with this famous line, to be or not to be. He was contempl contemplating death. In fact, he's considering suicide. To live or not to live. And he thinks how pleasant it would be to just go to sleep and leave life's difficulties and headaches behind and dream. But then he ponders what he's thinking about and he wonders what dreams may come. And sleep also has nightmares. What if that is his sleep of death? It gives him pause. In fact, it frightens him. As it should. The world and unbelievers have no assurance beyond death. Is it paradise? Is it oblivion? Is it worse? Is it hell forever? Eternal separation, eternal alienation, aloneness. That's part of what hell is. It is being isolated and alone forever with the burden of one's guilt fully felt. So is it that? Is that what they're, is that, is, that's what Hamlet was contemplating. Eternal night? That is a nightmare. The Christian knows what dreams will come. And we know that they're far more than dreams. Our future is real. Our future is certain. It is eternal day. It is rest. It is glory forever. We know that because we have Revelation. We have a Savior who died and was raised, who entered the grave and returned from it. He has gained for us life forever and the resurrection to come. He is the resurrection and the life, and our hope is in Him. So every believer in Jesus Christ has that certainty and can say with the Apostle, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. With that hope, may God give us the grace to rest in that, to believe that firmly, and then to live in light of it.
to live for him today, to live for all eternity. If you've not believed in him, he invites you to come to him. We come through faith. It is the the open hand, that's what faith is, that receives the gift of salvation that He has obtained for all who believe in Him through His death. So trust in Him. Receive eternal life and then by God's sovereign grace live for Him to His glory and to our own future glory. May God help you to do that. Well, we have much to be thankful for and much to rejoice in. Let's stand and sing hymn number 27 in the Songs of Praise book, Pensive, Doubting, Fearful Heart, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 27. Father, it's a great thing for a believer in Jesus Christ to be able to say we are graven on your heart and nothing can erase us from that, from your eternal, infinite affection for us and your purpose to bring us into your presence someday and raise us from the dead. We have that hope. It's certain. We thank you for your grace and all that you did for us through your Son to purchase us and give us life that's everlasting, eternal, and the glory of the hope of the glory to come. We thank you for that. May we embrace that and understand it increasingly in our life. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.